whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God alone I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Welcome back, everyone, to Preterist uh, Apologetics, and we appreciate you being with us so very, very much. My name is Don Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute. That's Mike Sullivan right over there, and we're just thrilled to be back with you again. Uh, you know, we started off looking at, at Romans 9 through 11, and we'd, we went all the way into chapter 11, and then the more Mike and I talked, the more we felt like we really needed to examine every one of the Old Testament prophecies that Paul cites in Romans 9 to 11. And when you do that, folks, you come away, I believe you come away, and Mike does too, with this overwhelming realization that virtually, not, not maybe there may be an exception or two, but virtually every single one of the Old Testament passages that Paul cites for the salvation of Israel, etc., also includes the prediction of the judgment on Israel. I mean, it's just everywhere in the passages that he cites. Now, before we get into, for instance, Isaiah chapter 28, uh, where we're, we're going to go, uh, Mike was going to develop for us uh, some really intriguing and fascinating concepts and thoughts from Isaiah chapter 53. So, Mike, uh, the floor is yours, dude. Sure. Um, I first heard this uh, from Pastor Curtis, who last week we touched on Isaiah 53, because, of course, that is one of the Old Testament texts that Paul cites. But notice in verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his. Now, some some translations do honor the plural here, but it is actually deaths. Whoa. Plural. <laughs> Whoa. Where'd Don go? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Hope you haven't fallen and can't get up. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. So there we, are. we have a plural deaths here. And I wanted just to briefly touch on that and, and maybe consider what that might be. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what did he say? He quoted and he cited Psalm 22 right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we can't wrap our minds around it. We don't, I, I don't think we can fully understand that. Just like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he who knew no sin became sin. It was imputed to him somehow, just like when the priest would lay his hand on the forehead of that goat, that scapegoat, and transfer the sin symbolically to the goat. Okay, so in some sense, Jesus experienced a separation from the Father. And that was the most painful, agonizing death one could go through. I touched upon <clears throat> Adam's death in the garden. It was a spiritual de death. The day you eat, you shall surely die, period, full stop. Like you said, mic drop, right? <laughs> full stop, mic drop. I saw that video the other day. I was laughing. Okay, so it's the spiritual death. Now, Adam would have died anyway. We believe that the creation had spiders that spun webs in which flies flew in and the spider ate it. We believe ant eaters were created with spouts <laughs> that actually ate ants. Leaves fell from trees. Okay, so there was physical death in the garden before Adam even sinned. Adam was created a mortal dying being. The two trees are simply, it's a test. Will he be faithful and eat from the tree of life and have eternal life as far as we have eternal life now, a continual spiritual relationship with the father. God's presence in the garden is, it's a probationary period. It's not as if, Adam had 
eternal life because i don't believe he had i don't see any evidence that he actually partook of the tree of life so it's it's laying it out as far as a test but he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so he died spiritually and he, he was going to die physically already but the point is where would adam die physically he would die out in the dust outside of the garden temple where god created him remember he created him and then he put him in the garden temple for the probationary period so now he's cast out and don talked a lot about this dust being symbolic of exile being away from god's presence and how israel repeats this as a corporate adam so let's look at christ's death for a second there's in some sense my god my god why have you forsaken me there's a spiritual death but it's a shameful death just like Adam's physical death was a shameful death. He died outside of God's presence in the garden. Jesus dies outside the gates of the city, a shameful death. And so that's why I think that there's the, the death here is plural. I think it is incorporating that spiritual aspect what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I agree with with everything that you've said. You know, it's really fascinating to me that when you when you begin reading some of the commentaries, uh, and I just went absolutely blank on which one it was. Um, one of the, one of the better known ones. I, I I apologize for that. If anyone wants the notice, if anyone wants the specific reference, I'll be glad to get it out of my files. But anyway, this particular commentator. And as I glance over here, I, my commentaries on First Corinthians are way over there, so I can't see it from here. But they make the comment, death was always present, which is exactly what you and I believe. But what happened was sin entered and made death something negative. It's a bad death now. It's a bad death. Exactly. Death without sin is not bad death it's a good death you're going right into god's presence <laughs> that's exactly right and, and you know this, <clears throat> this blows my mind uh mike we, we are hearing from some former preterists uh, and and if i can paraphrase what they have said uh with maybe just a tad drama thrown in uh heaven is okay but yeah. it's not what we're really looking for <clears throat> and so you're going okay wait a minute um, heaven in the very presence of God and the very presence of Jesus, that's okay. But what we really, 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 really are looking for is to leave heaven one day and come back to earth and to live on this renovated earth that, that is populated and overpopulated maybe with bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. And, but they won't bite us and they won't get slime on us, <laughs> you know, and, and what have you how anyone could say that heaven is a second rate hope. And as some commentators down through the years, I believe it was Martin Luther who actually said, uh, and, and he and Calvin took totally different views on the state uh, of the dead. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Calvin denied that a man went to heaven when they die. A most faithful Christian does not go to heaven. Uh, Luther, of course, did. But Calvin responded, it would be a foolish person indeed who would desire to leave heaven to come back to earth Nice to get a body. <laughs> I like that. You got, you got to send me that quote. I'd look, love to have Oh, yeah. It, 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 it's absolutely a fantastic quote. Uh, and, and that shows you that the, uh, the confusion that exists in the commentary, so there's back to this commentary that I that I took note of there for just a moment ago. This this commentator was saying death was never the problem, sin was the problem, mm -hmm. and he said. By the way, John Calvin said this too, and I didn't I I, I did not know about the quote until I, I had had my book, The Death of Adam, Life of Christ, almost written, mm -hmm. and I found the quote from John Calvin. John Calvin said, sin is the problem of death. Death mm -hmm. is not the problem. 
And he said, and I had put it in my own words. I didn't realize I was putting it in the words of John Calvin. If you deal with sin, you've dealt with death. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, that, I, that, put, that puts the whole subject of resurrection on a different level. Whereas traditional Christianity wants to talk about, oh, well, the problem is tissue. It's physical, physical stuff here. No, the problem of death was sin. Yes, absolutely. You deal with sin, you've dealt with death. Absolutely. And yes. by the way, William William Bell just completed a study on, on his uh, blog and then on his channel of how 1 Corinthians 15 is focused on redemption, deliverance from sin. It is not deliverance from physical body. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, so the, it, this, the, victory, the victories over the sin, the death that came through Adam, spiritual death, and exactly. the law. That's the victory. And, you know, if Christ's imputed righteousness and the forgiveness of sin in the new covenant and dying and being in his presence forever isn't exciting enough for you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you because, you know, I, I saw your interview with Scotty. And uh, he was he was literally speechless when he says, uh, well, well, what do we have to look forward to next? Uh, just heaven. And you said, uh, so what's wrong with heaven? <laughs> I mean, silence, because I mean, if that is not your ultimate, you know, mm -hmm. excitement, God's presence now and enjoying his imputed righteousness and forgiveness and abundant life here and now to live as Christ, to die as gain. I mean. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, like I said, I'm staggered that that believers in Christ could actually impugn the glory, the worth of heaven yeah. and, and being in heaven. And, and of course, others take the position, well, when we die, we're just uh, this is not the term they use, but it certainly amounts to it. They believe that when we die, we're just like Rover, we're dead all over. We have no consciousness. And this one person that I was watching a video just recently, <clears throat> they said, well, the problem with, with of dying and going to heaven is that to be in heaven without a body makes us subhuman. Yeah. It, it means that we're not truly a human being. Well, of course, Sam Frost has said that for a good little while. Uh, yeah, and and our, it, our response to him in our book, uh, House Divided in the Appendix section, and uh, Dave and I, pretty much thought about it at about around the same time. It's like, okay, Sam, let's carry this out. So you're saying Jesus was not a man, was not a human for three days and three nights. Is that yep. correct? We never got an answer. No. You know, I mean, because this is the absurd position that you will have to take if you're going to go down that road. That's exactly right. And there are all sorts of other ramifications to that. And it all gets back, um, you know, for the last several debates that I've had, I have asked my debate, a, a, a debate a opponent, but I can't even talk tonight. Uh, is the child of God redeemed by the blood of Christ? Is physical death the enemy of that child of God who is redeemed and purified, cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ? And I'm just, I, I've just been blown away. Every one of them has said, yes. Although one of them did say, no, not really, because physical death was never the problem of the garden anyway. Nice. That, that was David Hester in, in a debate that I had with him, had two debates with him, actually. But all of the other opponents, debate opponents have said, yes, physical death is the enemy of the child of God. Well, wait a minute. The wages of sin is, oh, I don't know. Um, what's it called? Oh, yeah. Death. Yeah. And so if the wages of sin is death, if the child of God has no sin because of the imputed righteousness of Christ, he is our righteousness, I think is how the apostle Paul put that. Okay. Not our own righteousness. He is our righteousness. Okay. So if we have no sin, if we are righteous in him, then tell me why in the world death is the enemy of the child of God. And I can't, 
uh, other than them saying, well, yes, it is. That's because Paul said it was the enemy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's unfortunate they don't look at the context of Romans chapter 5. He does start that out, that chapter out with the Greek word mellow. Adam was a type of him, Christ, who is about to come. About to come. Chapter 424 talks about the imputing of that righteousness that was about to be accredited to them when he would come chapter right. five. And then it's, Oh, and it's undoing everything that Adam brings in the wages of sin. Adam sinned the day he sinned, he died spiritually. And in Christ, we have the free gift of eternal life. We have justification. Um, and these are all spiritual internal positional truths they're not tish, like you say tissue issues at all and 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 what that what that brings up is and this is this is irony i mean the irony is this deep when it comes to this and that is if if you say we are told if you say that we have eternal life right now we shouldn't die well if you're talking about physical death yeah that's right <laughs> that's your problem and it ain't a, it ain't ours but so what we're told is, well, what we have, and by the way, this is a traditional position uh, in the all-millennial world of the Church of the Christ in which I was raised. Uh, if, if someone, <laughs> I'll never forget this, it was, it was really, in a lot of ways, it was a fearful part of my life because I heard preacher after preacher after preacher say, what, what would you say if somebody asked you, are you saved? Do you know that you are saved right now? You better be careful that the one thing who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall now. Fear, 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 fear. Fear just poured out of everywhere right. uh, in, in that mentality. And so the way it was explained is, you know, First John chapter 5, verse 13, John said, little children, I've written these things unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the gift of God. Mm -hmm. First John chapter 4. And so, what we were told constantly drilled into us, what we have right now is the promise of eternal life. We don't have eternal life. We have the promise of eternal life. We don't get it until Christ comes. Well, you know what? Abraham had the promise of eternal life and he didn't have it. So I'm in no better position in Christ than, than Abraham was who saw Jesus far off. He was thrilled to see Jesus far off. But he didn't have what Jesus was going to bring. And I don't have it either. <laughs> and you can't have it. So what Very this means, question. what this means is, and here's where the irony comes in. We do not genuinely have forgiveness until Jesus comes. Well, we know that it would be forgiveness, which is redemption. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of our sin. So. When would redemption come? Oh, the day of the Lord, Ephesians 4.31. So here, here's this irony. We as preterists are castigated, criticized, and condemned, I mean, all day long for saying, well, forgiveness didn't come until AD 70. And we say, well, that's what Romans 11, 26 and 27 says. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin, for the Redeemer shall come out of Zion. There's the second coming. Yeah. When it when is sin taken away? Coming of the Lord. Okay. So how then could Paul say we have received the atonement? Romans chapter five and verse ten. How could Paul say we are we are saved by grace through faith? Ephesians two eight and nine. How can he put all of these present tense realities and then turn right around and say, well, we're looking for redemption at the day of the Lord. Yes. And we're looking for salvation at the day of the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And I know what you're going to say, but go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think our, our minds are thinking to uh, uh, Hebrews chapter nine. I'm, Absolutely. I'm, I'm guessing. So um, the whole idea of Christ appearing a second time, the context there is Christ appearing as the high priest a second time. In Israel's history on the Day of Atonement, once a year, the high priest would go into the most holy place, uh, put the blood on the ark, and then come out. Atonement was not 
finished until he came out <clears throat> and he sprinkled the eagerly awaiting congregation that were eagerly waiting his imminent coming out of that temple to apply now that redemption sprinkled the and that's what Hebrews talks about. They're waiting for the high priest who has ascended into the most holy place in heaven to come from heaven to sprinkle the conscience of the eagerly waiting congregation. So uh, I'm reminded of a movie by um, Ridley Scott, The Kingdom of Heaven. And they're asking, well, what, you know, the, the Muslims are fighting over yeah. Jerusalem and the Crusaders. And he says, what is Jerusalem? And he says, it's a kingdom of consciousness. <clears throat> like, close. Yeah. <laughs> very, very close. <laughs> so it, that, that's, that's kind of the point. Now, Gene in our, in our group here says, he says, I have thought for years, if physical death is the wages of sin and we still die, we pay for our own sins. Christ died <laughs> in vain. And he says, you know, thanks, guys. So... <clears throat> I'll I'll let you take that away. Well, it, it goes goes back to what you began with this ever so briefly there in Isaiah chapter fifty three, and that is the two deaths. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here, uh, look, folks, if we are not genuinely objectively forgiven, and and by the way, when I when I debate a Church of Christ member, that's one of the questions I ask them before the debate: Is the child of God genuinely objectively forgiven of sin? And you'd be surprised at the number of times I get, well, not really. We're not forgiven until the end of time and, and the coming of the Lord. And yet, remember, they'll turn right around and say, you're a bunch of heretics for saying that forgiveness didn't come until AD 70, that it came in AD 70. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, you say it doesn't come until the end of time. I say it comes in AD 70, but I'm the heretic. There you go. Well, there, you know, as there is that there's a lot of bondage in that in that theological system as it is, as is in some other ones where they're so legalistic minded, they're so performance oriented, not really understanding grace completely, that it's just like if they had a lustful thought and they're walking across the street and a car hit them. Boom. And I, I asked someone affiliated with the Churches of Christ this. I said, well, did he go to heaven? I, I nope. don't think so. He, don't he, didn't think have so. Time, he didn't have time to repent of that lust. I know. He didn't, get to walk, he didn't get to walk down the aisle. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, yeah. But listen, but, you know, I, this, I this, was a Christ, this was a Christian. Yeah, uh, allegedly. This was a Christian who had a moment of sin and died right before he could confess. He lost his salvation. I know. I know. And uh, that, that just broke my heart. That, that And this was well, a preacher. Believe you me. It breaks my heart to look back in retrospect at that, mm -hmm. that I once believed and I once advocated. And, and, and let's face it, uh, you, you know this, and it's the same for any denomination. People can be caught up in a system that is, in fact, legalistic, that is, in fact, works-oriented, and they don't even realize it. They honestly do not realize it because they love the Lord. They're doing the very best that they can but they're so locked in uh, and we'll, we'll move on from this here momentarily. But I was in a study with some people from, uh, from an ultra conservative, ultra conservative church of Christ background. And uh, they attended our congregation, said they wanted to study with me. Now, I, I don't want to take too much time on this, but they're, they're from what's known as cups and classes background for those with Church of Christ background, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in this element of the Churches of Christ, they believe it's wrong to have more than one cup for the communion service. It's sin. It's a condemning sin to have more than one cup for the communion. And it's a sin, a, a damnable sin, if you've got children gathered in a classroom over here to be taught on their grade level, and then another class of people on another level and then finally the adults. That that's damnable sin. So it's called cups and classes. And so these people atten started attending our, our congregation. Said they'd like to study with me. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I, I'm almost I'm almost frightened of this study 
Mm -hmm. She goes, why? I said, because they want to talk about cups and classes and I want to talk about grace. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and I said, you know, this is, this, these are two polar opposites. Mm -hmm. So we gathered together on Saturday for the very first time. And I said, okay, guys, how, how would you like to begin or what would you like to study? And they said, well, you know, our background, we'd like to study cups and classes. And I said, no. Hmm. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, well, you just asked us. I said, yes. And I said, I knew what your answer was going to be. And I said, I don't want to talk about cups and classes. And they said, what do you want to talk about? I said, I want to talk about grace. What? That was such a foreign concept to them. Wow. Bless their hearts. Oh, yeah. I mean, literally, it, it almost made me cry. Yeah. Well, as, as we went through the study, okay, I asked a question. Okay, James says, whoever keeps the perfect law of liberty, liberty and yet offends in one point, he is guilty of the whole law. I said, let me mm -hmm. ask you a question. Do you believe that's the gospel message? And they looked at me and they looked at each other and they said, well, yeah. I said, no, brethren. Mm -hmm. He's describing life under Torah. Mm -hmm not life under the gospel. And I expounded on it. Okay. The woman started crying. Wow. The man sat there <clears throat> totally stunned and their family around them stunned as well. The, um, well, the conversation went on. I gave some illustrations, but I said, the bottom line is, do you think that Christ came to give us a system where under the old law, it's one sin you're condemned and Christ came to give us the gospel in which one sin you're condemned. And it hit him. It hit him. That's awesome. No, through, through the one man, sin and death, spiritual death, sin, spiritual, internal struggles and conflicts okay this is the groaning of romans chapter eight yeah amen. the decay that's taking place but through the one man christ jesus has come the free gift of grace and eternal life and justification i went through all that with these people and so when I came down and posed that question to them, did Christ come to give us a system exactly like the law? One sin, you're mm -hmm. condemned. One sin, you're sent to hell. And they, no. And I said, that's why I don't want to talk about cups and classes. I want to, <laughs> I want to talk about the liberty and the freedom that is in Christ. Did they connect the dots? Oh, well, like I said, the woman started yeah, crying. Fine, yeah. And the man sat there for a moment and he said, you know what? I think I've just heard the gospel for the first time in 40 years. Then I almost cried <laughs> 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 because yeah, they, they saw the message of grace and the contrast between the old covenant and the new. And I told him, I said, look, nothing I'm saying negates the necessity or the requirement of, of obedience on our part. I said, Paul said, God, me think that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin. But I said, that's not a meritorious salvation right. at all. Right. And so, like I said, I developed that. And, and so it, it was one of the most fantastic studies, I, I must say, that I've ever had in my life. When, when people, you can just see the, you can see the load of legalism being lifted off of their shoulders yeah. and, and, and the joy and the liberty and the freedom of Christ just gushing, rushing in to their consciousness. Yeah. You know, and, and scripture is filled with this positional truth. First Corinthians 13, when we see him face to face, the new Jerusalem is this perfect cube, the most holy place, but it's decked out with jewels and gold He's trying to describe in a Jewish worldview how we look to God, having his righteousness imputed to us, being a mature man now, being glorified and having that righteousness imputed to us. And, you know, for those that think that this is a physical city like the Borg that someday that's going <laughs> to 
you know, somehow land on Earth without totally destroying it is, <clears throat> is such a perversion. But anyway, we have gone woo, kind of well, kind of, and not really. I mean, Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, it's 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 stuff. within the acceptable bounds, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Hey, you know what? Because it puts us in the framework of seeing that there is such a thing as a good death. Absolutely. Amen. A, a and good the, death in the presence of Christ, having his righteousness. You know, my sister-in-law passed away suddenly about six years ago. She had surgery. She was doing absolutely great. A day and a half after surgery, the nurse came in. She was dead. Mm. And they, they had no explanation whatsoever. And an autopsy showed no explanation whatsoever. She just simply mm. died. Okay. Wow. I, my brother asked me to preach the funeral. It was extremely hard to do. You know, so, some funerals are hard to do because the person that died was, for lack of a better term, a real rascal. And what are you going to say? Right. And I've had to preach a lot of those, unfortunately, of people just kind of randomly pick a name out of a phone book. Oh, I need a preacher because our whoever died. And it's like, I don't know this dude. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, he was a drunk. He was this, you know, on, on and on. She was an extremely dedicated Christian woman. That makes everything better. That makes pre for preaching a sermon. Amen. And one of my very, very favorite passages for preaching a believer's funeral is Philippians 1, 19 and 21. Hmm. And Paul says, I'm, I'm torn between two. Mm -hmm. I know that to remain with you is better for you. No question about it because he was their leader. He was their founder, their leader, their guide, their apostle or to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, better. And I, I, I made the tie in with first Thessalonians chapter five, verse 10, where Paul summarizing his thoughts in regard to the day of the Lord. And Paul said there that his su summary statement was, whether we live or whether we die, we live with him. Amen. Absolutely. And I, I, there were some people in the audience who had clearly <laughs> never made the connections and everything. And I, I had people just going, wow, you know, and obviously that wasn't the reason that I did that. It was to give comfort because of the realization that there is such a thing as a good death. Now, do we mourn the loss of a loved one? Absolutely. I, I can't even fathom losing my wife after 54 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, we talk about it where we got to take care of this legal thing and that legal thing, and, you know, don't want to talk about it right. <laughs> because I can't imagine life without her. Mm. You know, she's not only my lover, she's the best friend I have in this world. Now, so the idea of that, mm -hmm. and yet that tremendous silver lining is the realization that she is a totally dedicated Christian. She walks with the Lord. She loves the Lord. And so that realization that the two of us have that bond of faith and that bond of destiny that is ours. You, you can't replace that. No. And, and so back to the idea to say, well, yeah, you're, you're both going to die and go to heaven, but boy, just wait till you get to come back to earth. <laughs> Absolutely bizarre. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and then they have a new heaven, a new earth where according to Isaiah 65, 17 to 23, there's physical birth. There's women having children you're laboring, you're building things. Um, there's physical death. There's sinners who are being preached the gospel. Doesn't sound like a perfect paradise, but uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. So you want to go back kind of and, and look at some of these Old Testament passages, which I, I loved. I mean, I, I did a study on this. I looked up every one. I, I had such a blast for the last couple of weeks. Do you want to go briefly back to the end of chapter 9? And deal with Isaiah 28. Oh, yeah. Briefly. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Isaiah 28, Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, as it is written, before, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of all fence, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, there, there are two, two passages from Isaiah uh, that are conflated here. That's Isaiah chapter 8 and Isaiah chapter 28. Now, l let's remember that when Jesus' parents, as we call them, when Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple, you, you have Simeon uh, and what's the woman's name? I just, Anna. 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 Okay. So they take Jesus and they lift him up. You know, uh, Simeon lifts him up and says, Lord, I, I give you thanks that I have been able to see the salvation of the Lord because he had been told that he would not die until he saw the salvation of the Lord. That's what you call a prolepsis, by the way, because Jesus is a mere baby. He hadn't saved Israel, hadn't saved anyone. And yet Simeon says, I've seen the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Prolepsis. Okay, so they cite, Simeon cites Isaiah chapter 8. He should be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for many in the, in the nation or in the house of, of Israel. Well, clearly he hadn't been that yet either. So it's this predictive uh, element of it. But what did it mean for him to be a stone of stumbling? Well, Isaiah chapter 28 sort of kind of picks up that thread and says, I'm going to lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Here's what's amazing about Isaiah chapter 28. Well, there are a whole lot of things. <laughs> Isaiah 28 is an extremely, extremely rich prophetic text. But among the things that are, that's just amazing about the passage is in the day in which the Lord would lay this foundation stone. And by the way, folks, what is this foundation stone for? Well, it's the Messianic temple. Absolutely. Okay. But if Jesus is the foundation, the cornerstone, and let's make no mistake, Psalms 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And Peter applies that directly to Jesus in Acts chapter four. So if Jesus <clears throat> is the chief cornerstone, are we talking about a literal <laughs> physical messianic temple here? <laughs> Oh, that's a yeah. little tough. Yeah, P Peter quotes it in uh, what was it? First Peter two. First Peter two. Uh, no, Second Peter two. I is it First Peter two or Second? First Peter, Peter two. First Peter two uh, quotes this, and it's it's the the cornerstone by which the church is being built up into the new man, into this messianic temple that would be matured in AD seventy when Christ would come out of Zion. Absolutely. Um, you know, interesting about Isaiah 28, you go up to verse 11. <clears throat> for, by, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people to whom he says, this is rest so forth. Um, Paul quotes this, 1 Corinthians 14. One of my former pastors and college presidents, John MacArthur, will go to 1 Corinthians 14, seeing this, and he says, well, look, you know, whenever they were judged, by foreigners and he equates that to the romans in ad 70 and he says tongue ceased in ad 70 but then he has prophecy you know it, it ending at a totally different period you know in the new wow. creation once that coming happens but um interesting uh but we also have over in verse 21 uh for the lord will rise up as on mount perizim as in the valley of gibeon he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed. And to work, his work alien is his work. And you got to remember, remember we went over uh, Psalm 69. God was going to lay a trap for those who had rejected his son. The majority of Israel would not believe. This is Paul's entire point in Romans 9 through 11. So it's interesting that he would cite Isaiah 28, because they would know, oh, yeah, this is another one of those Old Testament prophecies that says when Messiah comes, 
you know, it's going to be a strange work because God's not going to judge the Romans. He's going to judge us. <laughs> and so, you know, we have 80, 70, you know, pretty much in a lot of places here. In, uh, and and let, let, let's develop a little bit more. And, and by the way, uh, in, in my book, uh, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat, I developed this quite at length because I, I well remember when I discovered, when I really, really dug into this and the Lord saying, well, I'm going to work a work, a strange work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then in chapter 29, he, did, he basically says the same thing. But notice here that he says the Lord will rise up as at Parizim. <clears throat> <clears throat> Parise him. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his unusual act. Now, therefore, do not be mockers, scoffers. Mm -hmm. We get to that in a moment. <laughs> right. That's Second Peter three. Absolutely. Okay. As the Lord's going to rise up like Parisim and as Gibeon. Well, folks, when you go there. <laughs> and, and you look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 10. <clears throat> Those are the two refer reference points, right? <clears throat> the Lord came, <clears throat> pardon me, not literally, not visibly, not bodily, but the Lord came on the behalf of Israel to save Israel at those two times. So here in Isaiah, the prophet calls their attention to two examples in their past his history in which Yahweh had come to their aid, but now he turns around and he says, but this is different. <laughs> the Lord is coming, that's to be sure. But he will do his awesome work, bring to pass his unusual act. And like you pointed out, Israel was looking for, asking for Yahweh to come on their behalf. But he said, no, no, no. This is unusual. It's not like in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm coming against you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in judgment of you. And I, I referenced chapter 29. So let me flip over chapter 29. What, what is it? Verse 13, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll begin at verse 13. And folks, just see if this doesn't sound familiar from Jesus' personal ministry. Matthew chapter 15, for instance. But anyway, therefore the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, uh, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men, like I said, uh, Matthew 15. Now watch. Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder. <clears throat> For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. That's bad news. Okay. <laughs> the wisdom of their wise men is going to perish. Well, how would that take place? Well, it's through the gospel in the first place where Paul said in 1 Corinthians Foolish. You know, cha chapter one, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Mm -hmm. And more if that is e ever true. But you see, here is, here are two examples in which God speaking to Israel, number one, about the time in which he was going to lay this chief cornerstone for the Messianic temple. And at this time, by the way, this is... Um, Isaiah 29 is another example, kind of like Psalm 69, of the blindness. You, we go back up to verse 9. Paul's in wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely, watch this. He has closed your eyes, namely, the prophets. Yeah. And has con uh, covered your heads, namely the yeah. seers. Mm -hmm. God was going to withdraw the prophets from Israel because of their rebellion, because of their sin. He only left them false prophets that told them to stay in the city. That's right. <laughs> and be destroyed. <clears throat> laying that trap again. 
of, uh, okay, so we, we've got two examples here of this strange work. And we've got this motif of blindness that we've already looked at ever so briefly in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Brethren, I tell you a mystery that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I really like what N.T. Wright says on this. He says, as much as we would like to think that Paul is saying, well, Israel's blindness will result finally or will be taken away finally at the fullness of the Gentiles, and therefore Israel will be saved because their blindness will be taken away. He said that violates the consistent pattern of this blindness motif. And he points it out that starting, I mean, in numerous Old Testament passages, the blindness of Israel leads not to their repentance. It led to their destruction. Isaiah chapter 6. Imminent judgment. Imminent judgment. Absolutely. Not a judgment far off, mm -hmm. but an imminent judgment. But Isaiah chapter 6, 9 and following. You know, this people, they've closed their eyes. They've closed their ears. Lest they hear with their ears, see with their eyes, understand with the heart, and I should heal them. And so the voice said, proclaim this, proclaim this. And Isaiah said, well, how long? And the voice said, until the cities lie desolate. Blindness leading directly to desolation. By the way, Mike, I don't know if you've ever noticed that in Isaiah chapter 6, I just noticed this a couple of days ago. I'm sorry, Isaiah uh, yeah, Isaiah chapter nine, six. <clears throat> Until the cities lie desolate and there be only a remnant left, 10% and then nothing but fire. And watch this. And it shall be destroyed again. Wait a minute. You have an imminent destruction leaving a righteous remnant but then a prediction that at some point of time, the land would be destroyed again. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, and, and I found one scholar that I, I read on that, uh, it's here somewhere, <laughs> uh, that took note of that. And he said, it's really difficult to, uh, to fathom uh, that Jesus was, applying Isaiah chapter six to his generation. And yet it's equal, it's more difficult to understand how he was not applying it to his generation when he quotes it to speak of the people of his generation. So he, he was, he was dealing with number one, the reality of blindness leading to imminent judgment, but also the prediction of another and, and again, destruction and here is Jesus drawing directly on Isaiah chapter six. You know, this people's heart is wax gross. They've closed their eyes. They've closed their ears. Let's say here, be converted and I heal them, leading to another destruction, which Jesus is putting in his generation. You know, interesting, you know, there's a, a lot of passages in Isaiah. I, I don't know how many, but the Jews understood that this, there was a, a partial fulfillment of the second exodus yes. with the Assyri through the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, with a remnant coming back under Ezra and Nehemiah being gathered back into the land, yes. building the walls, building the temple, building the city, so forth. But they understood this second destruction and this second restoration that David would bring, that his Messiah would bring, and he would gather the people again, but not in a land, in himself. They would already be in the physical land. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's where Michael Brown just, again, goes, goes wrong. He has blinders on in the Old Testament, and he will not let Christ's hermeneutic and the inspired apostles' hermeneutic take those blinders off because it's the same blinders that the Pharisees had and not understanding the kingdom. That's why it was such a strange work because yeah. they were looking for the kingdom as a physical kingdom in which he was going to destroy the enemies and set up the same old kind of kingdom of, of the previous four kingdoms and yep. their old covenant kingdom. And he says, no, it's going to be a new work. 
and it's going to be a strange word. And in Deuteronomy 32, he says, you will not be able to discern your end when it comes in that perverse and crooked generation. And Peter also quotes Psalm 118, 22, the stone passage there. And in Peter, he talks about them being destined to disobey the word. Why? This goes back to Deuteronomy 32. It was prophesied that the majority of Israel would reject the rock in Deuteronomy 32, which I finally have an admission that is a messianic, uh, that some of the Jews understood that rock there that they would reject as Messiah, which fits perfectly in with these other uh, stone and rock uh, passages. But Peter says that they were destined to disobey the word and that their judgment was not asleep. Their judgment would not delay. Peter is tracking all over oh. Isaiah 28, Psalm 118, 22, and applying it the same way Jesus does in Matthew 21. He gives, he curses the fig tree. Then he tells the disciples, pray imprecatory prayers you'll be able to cast a mountain into the sea. We see the imprecatory prayers in Romans chapter six. The martyrs are praying, how long until you avenge us? Going back to Deuteronomy 32, the avenging. And we see in, Re in Revelation eight, what? A mountain is uprooted and cast into the sea and is burning. That is old covenant Israel. But later on in Matthew 21, he quotes again, this passage and he says that they are they're going to stumble over me the stone and the pharisees perceived that he was speaking of them and that is when the kingdom would be taken from them and given to a nation that is bearing the fruits thereof again going back to peter which says we are that elect holy nation that does bear forth fruit because we abide in christ and we abide in his finished work that's how we bear fruits good stuff so uh, let me make just one final observation here on paul's use <coughs> pardon me of isaiah chapter 28 in the passage that you cited of uh, first peter chapter 2 peter draws on either quotes directly from cites echoes or alludes to every single Old Testament prophecy of the rejected stone. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Now, what did all of those Old Testament prophecies of this rejected stone, what did all of them have in common? Those who rejected that stone would be crushed. Mm -hmm. So just like just like we've been trying to emphasize in Romans, that every uh, in Romans 9 to 11. Every single Old Testament prophecy that Paul draws to the attention of his readers, every one of those, with maybe one or maybe, maybe one or two exceptions, every one of those prophecies not only has a positive side to it. I mean, after all, Isaiah chapter 28, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone. That's wonderful news. Like I said, that's the messianic temple. That's salvation. That's the presence of God. Wonderful news. But Isaiah chapter 28 goes ahead to say, behold, you scoffers, you despisers, uh, do you, <laughs> you're in trouble <laughs> because the Lord said, I'm going to kindle a fire and it shall consume the earth. That's second Peter chapter three mm -hmm. in the last day scoffers mm -hmm. shall come saying, where's the promise of his coming for this? They are ignorantly uh, willing to ignorant of. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are. Or that's what the scoffers said. Mm -hmm. But Peter said, the day of the Lord will come. And what would it do? It burn like fire, just like Isaiah predicted that the scoffers were going to come in the day of the scoffers and they would be destroyed in the day in which the foundation stone would be laid. So here is this two-edged sword of wonderful news of the laying of the of the uh, laying of the chief cornerstone coupled with the really dire warnings against those who would scoff at that message now there i want to return to what we've seen here in isaiah uh chapter 28 and 29 and that is the lord made a promise i'm going to do a marvelous work and a wonder um 
I'm Jeez. going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Well, guess what? In Habakkuk, we also have another promise. Now, here's Habakkuk, contemporary of Jeremiah, probably, predicting the impending fall of Jerusalem. Well, what happened at the time in which Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Zephaniah were predicting the imminent fall of Jerusalem? Well, you have scoffers saying, you know, in Jeremiah chapter 27 and 28, here's Jeremiah predicting the coming imminent destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and some of the false prophets. I've forgotten the name of, of them at the moment. Uh, they're kind of difficult to remember, but nonetheless, they stood up and said, Oh no, 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 no. Uh, within two years, within two years, the temple uh, vessels are going to be brought back and there's going to be peace and we're, everything's just going to be cool. And, and Jeremiah goes, uh, no, in two years, you're going to be dead. <laughs> Uh, so we, we have the scoffers operative at the time of the prediction of the coming destruction. Scoffers prediction. Well, guess what? Over here in Acts chapter 13, Paul stands up in the synagogue uh, of Antioch of Pisidia, if I remember correctly. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 40, a bunch of the Jews reject him. He has to say concerning the Jews, well, seeing that you count yourselves unworthy of eternal life, uh, henceforth we turn to the Gentiles. But notice what he says, uh, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken by the prophet come upon you. Hmm. And he quotes verbatim from Habakkuk chapter one, verse five. So what were the scoffers doing in Habakkuk's day, in Jeremiah's day, Zephaniah's day? Oh, no, no, peace, peace when there is no peace. Remember what, <clears throat> what the people said in Jeremiah's day? Woe to those people, woe to the prophets who say peace, peace when there is no peace. Scoffers. So here in Paul's day and Paul's ministry, he's preaching to the Jews. They're rejecting him. So he says, you know, brethren, you better beware lest that which is spoken by the prophet come upon you. What did the prophet predict? Follow Jerusalem, judgment on them for unbelief, for sin and unbelief, for rejecting the opportunity to repent. And Paul's saying, brethren, don't don't reject this message because if you do, if you despise this and uh, they're called despisers. Well, I wonder if despisers are scoffers. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Behold, you despisers marvel and perish. Now notice what he says, for I will work and work in your days that no man would believe even if someone told him of, of it. Well, guess what the message was in the first century Jerusalem is going to fall. And the Jews, Jewish response to that was, <clears throat> we're going to kill you for saying this. You're, you're, you're touching our idol here. That's exactly right. That's exactly precisely what they were doing, saying or thinking at least and acting, acting out. So we have three truly remarkable Old Testament prophecies that in the last days, and of course, first of all, in the prophet's day, the people didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the, uh, the message of judgment coming. But the New Testament writers are, are using those prophecies. I think it's a, a scholar by the name of Le Rondell and N.T. Wright and Scott McKnight all say this as well. The New Testament writers read the Old Testament through the, through the lenses of typology. Yes. They, they believed that the things that happened under the Old Testament time were typological of what was happening in the New Testament. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, concerning events, those things were types of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, no, these, those things happened unto them as types of us. Adam is a type of him who is about to come. Israel's redemptive history, her exodus, her bondage, her slavery coming into the land. All these were pictures to develop what Christ would come and recapitulate as God's true son 
and true Israel and true seed and who we become in union with him through our faith. Absolutely. Well, we covered Isaiah 28 a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) We did. And uh, so I kind of gave some false advertising because I thought we were going to get into Isaiah 27. uh, And you ought to have known better than that. (laughs) But we were close. We just were one chapter off. And we're we're gonna go into uh, some of these other Old Testament passages. Uh, we're gonna go. Or we're gonna spend a lot of time probably in Deuteronomy thirty-two, without doubt. Uh, Romans ten, uh, nineteen. So we'll have to cover that. And Isaiah sixty-five is going to be a butte as well. And then we'll get back into Romans eleven. <laughs> All right, guys. Lord bless. Time is up, as you have seen. As we are looking at these Old Testament passages, we're seeing this theme of the salvation of one Israel or one Jerusalem, which is a remnant at the same time, the judgment of the physical city, the majority of the nations who are persecuting the righteous remnant. And then how this is being recapitulated and played out in Israel's last days between AD 30 to AD 70 and how God was going to save the Jerusalem from above Galatians chapter four, the new covenant remnant believers while destroying and judging the Jerusalem from below the old covenant and doing away with that system completely. Well, Don, this was a great study. I enjoyed getting into grace and I hope that that really blessed um, some of you folks out there and stay tuned for next, next week, next Friday, pay attention to Don's morning musings. They're always so good. And uh, what is the date of that debate you have? Uh, March 18th. As of, yeah, it, it had to be rescheduled for some because of some scheduling conflicts, but we've got it set right now for March the 18th. All right. Excellent. Yep. All right, guys. With that, we will catch you, as Don says, on the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Don. Yeah. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. God alone I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me?